But now, how he puts yeah, it back is yes, the question. I was going to say, the point that I'm concerned to get at now is that he seems, in arriving at his indubitable propositions, to have painted himself into a corner, corner. Yes. because he's given himself yes. indubitable propositions, which he himself has shown at a previous stage of the inquiry, can't be used to infer any certain truth yes. about the existence of anything outside myself. Well, he, he, all he's seen at the earlier stage of the proceedings is that the most obvious way of inferring the world from them isn't valid. He's now going to give you a way which he claims is. Now, of course, some people think that this actually is a bit of a conjuring trick and that he actually tries to get himself out of the corner into which he's painted by the well-known hero of the thriller novel. You know, likely he threw off his bonds, but I mean, this is how it works. He, he now... Having, as you rightly say, got to the point at which he, it is only the contents of his consciousness which he is acquainted with. There's nothing else available to him. It's obvious if he's going to put the world back, he's got to do it entirely out of the contents of his consciousness. Mm. So he's got to find something in the contents of his consciousness which leads outside himself. And he claims that what this is is the idea of God. He discovers among the contents of his consciousness the conception of God. And he argues that this is unique among all the ideas that he has, among all the things that are in his mind. This alone is such that the mere fact that he has this idea proves that there is really something corresponding to it. That is to say, there really is a God. That's a very difficult one for many modern reasons as well, yes. isn't it? Of yeah. course. In fact, he has two different arguments, both of which he uses in the meditations for doing this. One is an old medieval argument called the ontological argument, which is, uh, I think, Perhaps we needn't spend time on that. Is that is, is a kind of logical puzzle, I think, a metaphysical puzzle. But it's it's much less characteristic of Descartes. The one that's really characteristic of Descartes is the argument which says, "I have this idea in my mind, but I see an absolutely intuitive, necessary principle, which is the lesser cannot give rise to the greater. The lesser cannot be the cause of the greater." Now, my idea of God is the idea of an infinite thing, and although it's only an idea in itself. It's nevertheless the idea of an infinite thing. It involves the idea that I can conceive an infinite being. But no finite creature, as I know myself to be, could possibly have given rise to such an idea, the idea of an infinite being. It could only have been implanted in me by God himself, as he memorably puts it at one point, as the mark of the maker on his work. God, as it were, signed me by leaving in this uh, infinite idea of God himself. When I reflect that the lesser cannot give rise to the greater in this way, I realize that since I have this idea of God, it can only be because there actually is a God who has created me. So he's then put in the position of founding our knowledge of the external world That's on right. a belief in the self-evidentness of the existence That's of God. Right. It's absolutely central. Yeah. The, the, arg the next bit then goes that it, it works like this. He then says, I, the things I know about this God, I know that he exists, I know that he's omnipotent, I know that he created me, and I know that he's benevolent. These are, of course, all traditional Christian beliefs. Um, and because God created me and is benevolent, he is concerned as much with my intellectual welfare as with my moral welfare. And what that means is that if I do my bit, and that's very important, and I clarify my ideas as much as I should, and I don't assent precipitately to things I haven't thought out properly, if I do my bit in that sense, then God will validate the things which I am then very strongly disposed to believe. Now, I find that however much criticism I make of my ideas, however carefully I uh, think out what is involved in my beliefs about the physical world and all that kind of thing, although I can suspend judgment doubt. I wouldn't have got to this point if I couldn't. Although I can suspend judgment in this doubt, I do have a very strong tendency to believe that there is a material world there. And since I have this disposition, I've done everything in my power to make sure that my beliefs are not founded on error. Then God will at the end, as it were, make sure that I am not fundamentally and systematically mistaken. That is, there is such a world. So, you know, by ending up arguing in effect that the world of science is given to us by a God whose existence is self-evident mm. and whose benevolence is self-evident. He, so to speak, not so much answered the sceptics about science as jumped 
over them, and he's well, bypassed them. Well, what somehow. he says is that he, it's absolutely essential for his position that he believes that these arguments that involve God mm. will be assented to by any person of good faith who concentrates on them enough. That's absolutely essential. He, he cannot accept, it's, it would ruin his whole position if you accepted the idea that whether you believe in God is a matter of cultural or psychological upbringing and perfectly sensible people can disagree about whether there's a God or not, however hard they think about it. It is essential to Descartes that to deny the existence of God confronted with these arguments is as perverse and as totally in bad faith as it would be to deny that twice two is four. And therefore the idea is that if you lead the skeptic properly through it, and the skeptic is an honest man and is not just mouthing words or trying to impress, and you put these proofs before him, he must at the end assent. Now, people have not done this because they haven't thought hard enough, they haven't split it into, they haven't done it in an orderly manner. A lot of the skeptics are in fact fakes who simply go around making a rhetorical position, don't really think about it. But if you're in good faith and think hard enough about it, then you will come to see this truth. And then you cannot consistently deny the existence of the external world. That's what he believed. Now, one very important outcome which this set of arguments had was uh, that of positing a world which consists fundamentally yes. of two different sorts of entity. There's the external world, which is, as it were, given to me by a god on whom I can rely. But there's me who is observing this external world. And he made a great point, again, in this earlier stage of the argument, when he's stripping away all the propositions that he can possibly doubt, of saying that when he's considering himself and the nature of his self, he can even imagine himself existing without a body. That's right. Absolutely but right. he can't imagine himself uh, well. not having the, the thinking awareness. Yeah, that's the point about the I am thinking being indubitable. Right. Yes, that's right. So one consequence of that yeah. is that you get a, a world positive which yeah. consists on the one hand of thinking entities yeah. which are locationless and substanceless and a world, a material world, which this thinking entity is thinking about or observing. And it's a world of observer and observed, mind and matter, uh, sure. spirit and material, yeah. yes. which has become built into the whole Western way of looking at it. That's it's absolutely right. Yes. Um, but now, uh, Descartes' ultimate aim from the beginning has been to establish the project of science, or of what That's we right. would call science. That's it. The project of what we yeah. would call science. And by the arguments that you've outlined, he's now arrived at a certain view of the external world. That's right. Now, how is this external world to be treated scientifically? Now, that, that, uh, you remember I mentioned earlier that when God, we, through the help of God, we put the world back again, we didn't put back quite the same world that we've thrown away, that it's criticized in the process. And in our reflections, we come to the conclusion that not only there is an external world, the external world, just as my essence as a thinking thing is simply thought, the external world has an essence too, and that's simply extension. It simply it takes up space that it's susceptible to being treated by geometry and the mathematical sciences. All its, as it were, colourful aspects, I mean the fact that it's coloured, that there are certain tastes and sound, these are really subjective. They're on the mental side. They're subjective things that occur in consciousness which are caused by this physical, extended, geometrical world. 